Well, thank you, thank you all very much <coughs> for coming this evening. I, I wanted to introduce um, myself and also to um, and, and Mark and say a little bit about um, why we're here and how we are going to organise uh, the event. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like particularly to welcome Lady Quinlan, who is here, uh, and um, various members of the, um, the Quinlan uh, family. So we're here to mark the publication of... Uh, of this uh, book on nuclear deterrence, the correspondence uh, of uh, Sir Michael uh, Quinlan. And as you'll see from um, uh, the cover, uh, this book uh, has been uh, written, drawing on the, um, uh, the correspondence of Michael uh, by Tanya Ogilvy uh, White. And she has, uh, she has brought together extracts from uh, Michael Quinlan's many letters uh, written uh, principally, I think, in the 80s and the uh, uh, early 90s of the last century. I feel quite old now. Um, and she's linked these together uh, with expert analysis and has also placed them uh, in uh, context. Now, originally, when I was uh, asked to come here tonight, I was asked very briefly to introduce her. Uh, so you may wonder where she is. Um, now, this is... <laughs> this is not a whodunit. Um, she, uh, she is a lecturer. Uh, I don't know how... Uh, some people in the room know her. Some perhaps may not know her. Uh, she is, in fact, a senior lecturer at the University of um, Canterbury in New Zealand and a consulting fellow of the IISS, amongst other things. And she has flown to this country uh, for this evening uh, to be introduced by me. Most people would indeed fly from New Zealand <laughs> to be introduced by me. <laughs> <laughs> and then, unbelievably, given this opportunity to be introduced by me, uh, she has been struck down with the flu, uh, which is, uh, when one thinks about flying from New Zealand, is not that uh, funny, uh, really. So uh, we have had to slightly rejig this evening, uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to make some introductory remarks, uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Mark, uh, and he is going to uh, make some remarks, drawing on uh, Tanya's uh, notes of what she might have said if she'd managed to be here. And then we will throw it open uh, for uh, a discussion. So if I can just begin with that, uh, uh, that uh, apology. I wanted also, for those of you who don't know who I am, um, which would be amazing, but I, I wanted to just introduce myself by way of talking about Michael Quinn. And now, as many of you will know, uh, Michael Quinlan uh, had two of the top jobs uh, in the Ministry of Defence, in some ways, the two top jobs in the Ministry of Defence. He was, uh, from 1977 to 1981, the, um, it was a slightly snappy title, the Deputy Under Secretary of State, <laughs> brackets, policy, uh, or as we called it, the DUSP, uh, since in the MOD everything is an acronym. Uh, and that was the key policy job inside uh, the Ministry of Defence, the person who dealt with strategy, policy, strategy, international uh, relationships. And then from 1988 to 1992, he was the Permanent Secretary uh, of the Ministry of Defence. And between these appointments, uh, he served uh, in the Treasury from 1981 to 1982, and then he was the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Employment from 1983 to 1987. And when you get to read the book, you will discover that, as the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Employment, amazing though it may seem, he had the time to continue a correspondence about nuclear matters. Now, my own interaction with him uh, was really um, twofold. In the 1970s, when he was the DUSP, or threefold, actually, in the 1970s, when he was the, um, uh, the Deputy Under Secretary of Policy, the DUSP, he worked upon uh, a project to do with the future of uh, the nuclear deterrent in the United Kingdom, and I was um, a fairly junior civil servant who worked directly to him uh, on that uh, project, uh, which went under the name of Duff Mason, which were the two people who superintended the work, but the driving force behind it uh, was Michael Quinlan, and I'll come back to that uh, briefly. Uh, I was then the... Uh, being the civil service, I was then the private secretary to the permanent undersecretary. I won't give you the acronym to that. And I saw his, I saw his interaction and the dynamic, while he was still the DUSP, of his relationship with the then permanent secretary, uh, an equally marvellous person in a different way, 
uh, Frank Cooper, and they worked together quite brilliantly as a team. And later, when he was the permanent secretary, uh, I was in fact by then uh, appointed by him the person who was the deputy undersecretary policy. So I can, I think, claim uh, considerable expertise uh, in what, what we might call uh, Quinlan uh, studies. Uh, <laughs> what I can't, uh, in fact, I could probably be a professor of Quinlan studies, uh, but what I can't claim is a detailed inch by inch knowledge of the correspondence, although I have actually um, uh, read it all. Now, of course, it is very, very unusual to find a, a senior civil servant engage in a correspondence of this kind. And when you read it, it is extraordinary stuff. Um, and for it also uh, to be uh, published, which I think, for a reason I'll come on to, is uh, a, a really excellent uh, thing. Now, why was his, why was his career um, uh, so uh, significant? For those of you, and I see people in the room, you know, who uh, didn't necessarily live out these years, perhaps they weren't even born, um, <laughs> uh, amazing though it might be. Uh, why was his career uh, so significant? Now, the first thing is, I think, when he came... When he, was the, when he came to be the Deputy Undersecretary of Policy, the DUSP, and he didn't come to be it by accident, I think these two things are linked, uh, it was at a time of acute sensitivity uh, in East-West relations. And I think we have to sort of try and cast our minds back to a completely different world. And in that context, uh, there was the, uh, de uh, the deployment by the Soviet Union of uh, a mobile intermediate range missile, we're at the ISS, so we're all happy here, uh, known as the SS-20, which in turn led to a big debate inside the alliance about what should be done, did this threaten uh, alliance deterrence and so on, and ultimately led to uh, a very, very important set of decisions uh, to uh, deploy ground launch cruise missiles uh, and Pershing-2 missiles and alongside those to pursue a twin track of arms control. And all of that, which was a very, very big debate in the alliance, was steered and shepherded by a group that was established for this purpose called the High Level Group. Uh, and Michael Quinlan was the UK member and was one of the, if not the, dominant force in that. So there's a piece of really big history here which shaped the way in which NATO thought about deterrence and thought about what needed to be done to sustain it. Secondly, he came to uh, his position in this key role at a time when the United Kingdom had to decide whether to maintain its nuclear deterrent after Polaris Chevalier, which was due to be life expired in the 1990s, and if so, with what system. And that argument began under Labour, and then it was completed under the Conservatives, and it led ultimately to the decision to adopt Trident C4 and then actually Trident D5 for various detailed uh, reasons. Now, it's difficult, as I say, perhaps to recapture precisely now the flavor of these times. There was really considerable public controversy over nuclear weapons matters. There was debate about the moral dimension uh, of uh, that set of issues and involvement uh, by churches of different denominations uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And it actually became a very, very big uh, political issue, uh, which led, for example, to the appointment of a Secretary of State for Defense slightly after Michael had moved to the Department of Employment, Michael Heseltine, who was basically appointed because he was thought to be good in handling that debate. Uh, and it led to a general election in uh, 1983 where defense was perhaps one of the biggest uh, issues. So why was it that Michael Quinlan, and this is shown, I think, in this amazing correspondence, was particularly well-equipped to tackle the issues uh, that I have laid out? And I just wanted to sketch out a smallish number of uh, reasons. The first was that these were inherently very complex issues, and they required rigorous thought and analysis. And as he himself uh, commented, nuclear issues were intellectually congenial to him because of their complexity uh, and their abstract nature. And there are many examples in the correspondence of him working through uh, this uh, process. Secondly, um, he believed in, uh, he fundamentally believed in more openness about these issues uh, and effective uh, dialogue about them. 
and he pressed government actually to be more open about them. Uh, this led to the odd complication because a white paper was eventually published about all of this and it was drafted in a style which could only be his and so people sort of fingered him as the author. But uh, he was the person who strongly pressed for more communication, more openness, more debate uh, about these issues. And again, in a way, the correspondence and its publication is a tangible symbol, I, I think, of this. And then thirdly, there was a very interesting personal strand. Uh, he was a Catholic, uh, and he had a very strong interest, an interest that, frankly, I don't have to put this delicately, I didn't find in all officials, uh, he had a very strong interest in ethical matters. So this really took two dimensions, I think. One was he needed, and this comes out again in the correspondence, he needed to establish to his own satisfaction that our position on uh, nuclear weapons, NATO's position on nuclear weapons, was ethically sound because that was a driving force for him. And once he'd established this, of course, he could then engage in uh, a, a debate in a compelling way uh, with others who were less uh, clear about this matter. And then lastly, I think, uh, in debates that were very per highly charged and often quite personal, he had a sort of outstanding and shining integrity which made it difficult for people uh, to question uh, his motives. Now, it's very, very difficult, um, briefly to summarise, his views uh, on the roles of nuclear weapons in war prevention and, uh, if necessary, in, uh, in war termination. These are set out uh, in, in the book. But his fundamental interest, this is a point I've made before, was not actually in uh, nuclear weapons themselves or in nuclear war but in the prevention of war of any kind between major powers. And if I have a quibble about the book, it's not really about nuclear deterrence. It's about on the prevention of war. And what he fundamentally believed was that what had happened after the second, after the, and during and after the Second World War with nuclear weapons had fundamentally made war between the major powers untenable. Uh, and this was not to be peace at any price. This was to be peace while sustaining our values as a free and democratic society. Now, there are lots of ways I could, uh, I'm coming to an end, but there are lots of ways I could illustrate this, uh, and also um, uh, his way of thinking from the, from the uh, correspondence. But I just wanted to pick out, just before I finish, um, one example which I think neatly encapsulates many aspects uh, of uh, Michael Quinlan's thinking uh, and also his mode of thought. When he was the um, permanent undersecretary of the Ministry of Defense, uh, he was invited to deliver a speech to the Soviet general staff in Moscow. And this was, this was a very, very uh, exciting time, actually. Uh, he and I worked together closely on this. Not on his speech. He didn't need to bother to ask me about his speech. He could do it without my help. Uh, but we worked very closely together on uh, how to uh, transform relations with, uh, with the Russians, um, and he took all this very seriously and uh, made a big contribution in this, as in so many other areas. Anyway, so he addresses the Soviet general staff uh, in Moscow in November 1990. And what he said, there's an extract in the book that I just want to read to you, was the following. The coming of nuclear weapons is not just another technological development in warfare like the invention of gunpowder or of aircraft. It does something more, more fundamental. It carries the potential of warfare past a boundary at which many previous concepts simply cease to apply. The combination of nuclear explosive power, the worldwide delivery capability of modern missiles, and the diversity and elusiveness of modern launching platforms makes available what is for all practical purposes infinite destructive power, power that cannot be warded off or exhausted. And this has to change our whole concept of what war can be about. War-making capability has reached and passed the limit of meaningful rationality. An unrestrained conflict between nuclear superpowers or alliances would therefore be not just an immense human calamity, it would be this is very Quinlan-esque. It would be, in the strictest sense, a logical absurdity. Now, how the Soviet um, uh, general staff 
receive this, you know, a logical absurdity, uh, the strictest sense and so on, I don't know. Uh, but it absolutely encapsulates uh, the way he thought about things, uh, in a sense, his, his style of presentation, and also that he was engaged in uh, a fundamentally uh, moral activity. And this fundamentally moral activity, which inspired and guided many other people, including me, uh, was about the prevention uh, of war. Last point for me. Uh, this correspondence uh, has been funded by uh, the Stanton Foundation, IISS, and a number of individuals who I won't uh, read out but are referred to in the acknowledgments in the book. And on behalf of all of those who would have loved to have read all of his correspondence, uh, and also to thank Tanya in her absence, I just wanted to say thank you to the people who had funded this project. Mark. Well, thank you, uh, Sir Richard. I now know why it was that it was recommended that uh, Sir Richard lead off this evening, uh, which is, uh, in Tanya's absence, now going to go downhill. Uh, Tanya is terribly, terribly disappointed that, uh, uh, to miss this event. Um, perhaps in equal measure, uh, sick with the flu and sick with remorse that she is not able to introduce her own book to sign copies and to meet all of you in person. Uh, but she is under doctor's orders uh, to stay in bed and, uh, and she couldn't speak if she was here. She's lost her voice and she's, uh, she's very ill. Uh, this afternoon she shared with me uh, her notes um, which I have melded uh, with some excerpts uh, from the book. Uh, but before I start, I should just say that some of you received uh, the first invitation to this event to uh, the Quinlan Papers. And uh, the Quinlan Papers was the working title uh, for this book. It had a certain uh, uh, Intel project ring to it, a certain um, <laughs> symmetry with uh, the Pentagon Papers, uh, uh, as though uh, uh, Quinlan, in his uh, individual intelligence and uh, uh, wisdom, was the equivalent of the whole Pentagon. Uh, you know, one man in some ways uh, is equal to the whole of the American bureaucracy. But we uh, changed the title because nuclear deterrence was, uh, even though it, the book does uh, deal with other matters, is really the essence of, uh, of uh, Sir Michael's uh, uh, position and view. Um, Tanya wrote this book, as uh, was mentioned, uh, while serving as a nuclear security fellow at the IISS under a grant from the Stanton Foundation, a fellowship that ended in June. Uh, she then returned to her position in Christ Church, but she maintained a uh, position with the IISS as a consulting fellow, um, a, a position somewhat like uh, Sir Michael's in the last years of his life. He was a senior consulting fellow at IISS. Now, his work here at this institute constituted but a small fraction of the oeuvre of his lifetime achievement in public service and intellectual output. But for us at Arundel House, that contribution loomed very large. He started in 2004 as a, uh, a senior consulting fellow for the South Asia program with my colleague uh, Rahul Roy Chowdhury. Uh, and he soon, though, began helping me more and more in the, uh, in the nonproliferation and disarmament program. Four and a half years ago, he inspired an institute study on the requirements for a nuclear weapons free world, arguing that there needed to be a middle path, a serious uh, intellectual exploration of a middle uh, path amidst the wide divergence between what he called the righteous, righteous abolitionists and the dismissive realists. His inspiration led to a seminal Adelphi by George Perkovich and James Acton on abolishing nuclear weapons, which itself spawned two other Adelphi books, one by James Acton, and ideas for yet more. So Sir Michael's contributions to the Institute's intellectual capital continue to reap dividends. To quote a bit from the introductory chapter of the book, Sir Michael Quinlan was no ordinary civil servant. At his memorial service, he was described as the leading civilian thinker within the British government on defense policy, a key architect of British and NATO nuclear doctrine and strategy during the Cold War, and one of the most brilliant and influential 
nuclear thinkers of his time. He lived and breathed nuclear policy when the international system was dominated by the nuclear arms race, when analysts on both sides of the Iron Curtain feared a catastrophic Third World War. He argued that the advent of nuclear weapons had made another major war unthinkable, and he believed that as long as they were handled, handled appropriately, nuclear weapons could play a stabilizing role in East-West relations. His ideas about that stability, how that stability could be achieved, shaped British nuclear policy for a generation. Quinlan's thinking on nuclear ethics and strategy is laid out in extraordinary detail in the thousands of private letters he wrote when he was serving in key positions in the British Ministry of Defense and elsewhere in the civil service. He wrote these letters in his spare time, filing copies of them and the replies he received at his home. Before he died two years ago, he made it known, maybe not explicitly but implicitly by the way he filed them, that he wouldn't mind if these letters were made use of after his death. This book helps fulfill that unexpressed wish. The book is intended as a memorial to Quinlan, an important historical record of British nuclear thinking during the Cold War, and a contribution to current debate over the future of nuclear deterrence, both in the UK and internationally. Michael Quinlan recognized clearly the significance of his letters to current as well as past nuclear thinking. And after his death, his family considered how best to maintain his legacy so that his thinking could continue to contribute. Peter Hennessy had a first look at the correspondence files and judged that there was real gold there. Lady Quinlan, Mary, later contacted me, and I found an enthusiastic reception among my SS colleagues for publishing the letters in an Adelphi book format. For a year, though, we couldn't find funding to hire somebody to transform these many thousands of letters into a digestible book. Luckily, we were able in spring 2010 to recruit historian and nuclear nonproliferation expert Tanya Ogilvie White under the auspices of a grant from the Stanton <coughs> Foundation. Her Stanton Fellowship lasted one year, so Tanya's challenge was to produce a volume in 12 months starting from the day shortly after her arrival in London that June when she and I, along with intern Josh Freeman, visited Mary and Tony in Banbury to talk about the project and to pick up the letters. I sensed then that Mary might have had mixed emotions about parting with the five filing cases of correspondence, but she didn't let on. She's been a strong supporter of this project all along. Indeed, she was the initiator. We learned while we were at the Quinlan home, by the way, that Sir Michael's successor at the MOD had already been through the papers and removed any material that was considered potentially uh, confidential, sensitive. Our second step was to assemble a group of Quinlan's contemporaries, uh, whom Tanya invited to become part of the project's advisory committee to provide guidance on the book and firsthand insights into Quinlan's life and work. That committee provided uh, proved invaluable, helping to raise uh, additional funding for the project, as well as offering information and colorful anecdotes. Those who provided intellectual and financial assistance are acknowledged at the beginning of the book and elsewhere. Tanya asked that we acknowledge uh, and thank those who are here, in including, of course, Mary and Tony, uh, Sir Richard, uh, Brian uh, Burnell, the IISS publications team, and the many who could not be here uh, or who will be at the Washington launch next week. The format that Tanya adopted for this book uh, is unusual for a book of correspondence in that she presented excerpts from Quinlan's letters linked by passages of analysis, drawing on relevant publications as well. She notes that she decided on this approach because it suits the nature of the material. Quinlan's letters typically contain long, detailed critiques of draft text sent to him. And while the first part of his letters can be captivating, the same is not true for all of his detailed point-by-point -point, uh, critiques. Sir Michael filed uh, the letters alphabetically by correspondent and often without contextual material. It took our intern, uh, Josh Freeman, two months just to scan 
and uh, organized them all, and it took Tanya all summer uh, just to read them. It became obvious to her that they needed to be presented thematically uh, rather than strictly chronologically. She thus organized the correspondence around three themes to show how Quinlan's thinking on nuclear weapons developed. These topics form the three equal-sized parts of the book, preceded by an introductory chapter that provides a brief outline of Quinlan's career, an explanation of the core assumptions that underpinned his thinking on deterrence, and some discussion of important contextual matters that offer important ins insights into his establishment role. The three parts of the book are, firstly, the logic and morality of nuclear deterrence, secondly, key strategic decisions in which he was closely involved, and thirdly, arms control and disarmament. <laughs> at one point, we at IISS considered unwisely that we ought to make these into three separate books uh, on the logic that Adelphi papers uh, generally consist of about 40,000 words, and Tanya had written about three times that many. There's a lot of correspondence there. Uh, but we uh, wisely uh, were advised to put them all together. Now, nearly all of the correspondence fits pretty nicely into these three themes that Tanya identified. Uh, it's possible that ad additional subjects uh, were addressed in letters that were removed from the files before the start of the project, and Tanya confesses that she might have missed important, interesting points in some of Michael Quinlan's handwritten notes. Uh, uh, and she, she politely said not that they were hard to read, but that they had faded over time. Um, now, Quinlan was known among his colleagues at the MOD as Big Q, the authority on all things nuclear. It was a role and reputation he enjoyed because he firmly believed nuclear weapons provided the best means for maintaining peace and preserving human life. Thus, for him, shaping British and NATO nuclear strategy and doctrine represented the ultimate in exercising public responsibility. As he admitted, he was also attracted by the complex and abstracted nature of debates on nuclear strategy and doctrine, as well as those dealing with moral philosophy. His intellectual curiosity is very clear from the correspondence, which delves into questions of deterrence ethics and strategy in fine detail, and with a rigor that leaves one no doubt about his fascination for the subject and his enjoyment of it as well as his sharp intellect. That was all from the introduction. Let me now read a bit from Tanya's notes she gave me this afternoon. The most striking theme that runs through nearly all of the letters in Michael Quinlan's deep uh, in uh, nearly all the letters is Michael Quinlan's deep horror of war and his determination to ensure that major conventional conflict on the, on the scale of the Second World War never happens again. This may be what fed his desire to work in defense in the first place and the main reason he was so interested in nuclear deterrence. He saw it as providing the best hope of preventing another war between the major powers, particularly between the USA and USSR. From this perspective, his own position as master of deterrence in the MOD was the ultimate exercise of public responsibility. The selflessness of Michael Quinlan comes across very strongly in the correspondence files. Tanya quickly got a deep insight into why it was that MQ reached such great heights in the civil service. He lived and breathed patriotism and public service. Those two traits combined with intelligence, leadership, integrity, and charm propelled him to the top. In addition to his civil service role, even during his time, Michael Quinlan had a second less public profes uh, professional role. Many of the letters fit into this second role, more it's a more private part of his life. It was the first thing that struck Tanya when she read through the letters, the number of detailed point-by-point -point critiques of his correspondence, ideas, and manuscripts. Most academics would be astounded at the level of detail Quinlan went into in critiquing deterrence manuscripts. He offered pages and pages of comments. Now, Tanya didn't include most of these in the book. Uh, partly because she suspected most of uh, the readers would have little patience for them, and including this level of detail would interrupt uh, the flow too much. They're fascinating, though, because they take one inside the mind 
of a highly disciplined intellectual. Anyone wanting to read the actual correspondence, the text of the letters, should be able to access through them through the KLC uh, Department of War Studies Library, where both the letters and the scanned PDFs are, now reside. In terms of tone, many of the letters in the files are, how shall we say, um, extremely combative. Um, don't make the mistake of thinking Michael Quinlan was the type of professor who suffered, who was prepared to suffer fools. Not at all. Sir Michael didn't beat around the bush when he thought someone's, someone's argument was flawed. He was extremely direct, both with friends and with strangers. He wanted to correct mistakes and put people right to ensure that deterrence was properly understood. His reasons for this were clear. Stability in Europe partly depended on shoring up public support for maintaining a credible nuclear deterrent. If too many influential figures became persuaded by the arg arguments put forward by CND, Britain and Europe would become more vulnerable to Soviet aggression. One of the most interesting motivations that drove Sir Michael's dedicated letter writing on nuclear issues was, as Sir Richard said, his deep Catholic faith. Unlike the vast majority of his critics, he believed that nuclear weapons were morally licit. One of the reasons he was so convinced of this was because he believed these weapons provided the most effective means for keeping atheistic totalitarianism at bay. In a word, he loathed Soviet ideology. He feared an atheistic onslaught on the Catholic Church. This comes across powerfully in some of the letters he wrote during the Cold War, especially his letters to senior figures in the Catholic hierarchy. Many of Sir Michael's colleagues in MOD might have been unaware of his avid letter writing, and he probably was keen to keep it this way. Due to the constitutional requirement that civil servants must not engage in open debate on topics that are politically <laughs> controversial, Quinlan was happy to keep his efforts, efforts quiet. When in the early 1980s, the Labor Party split on the issue of unilateral disarmament, Quinlan was given clear instructions to refrain from public debate on nuclear deterrence. But he only partly complied. He stopped speaking in public forums, but he also stepped up his letter writing ensuring that he took every possible chance to influence the debate from behind the scenes. This included a major personal effort to prevent the Church of England and Wales from following in the footsteps of the US bishops who had denounced all nuclear use as immoral. And it included strenuous efforts to prevent CND activists from inf infiltrating church offices and from occupying the moral high ground unchallenged. This was a key driver of Michael Quinlan's correspondence. He wanted to ensure that pro-deterrence arguments could be explained in a way that gave them at least equal moral standing. This is partly why he never referred to nuclear weapons as a necessary evil, the way some of his colleagues did. He preferred to keep the word evil out of the debate unless he was referring to the Soviet Union. Although he was not known for his expertise on non-proliferation and arms control as much for his deterrence logic, Sir Michael was interested in these issues as well. When he was invited by Margaret Thatcher to draft her speech to the UN Special Commission on Disarmament in 1982, he replied with gusto. He kept a keen interest in arms control and disarmament issues throughout his career. This is strongly reflected in the letters, which is why Tanya devoted the third part of the book to that topic. The striking point about his letters on disarmament is that they began to change after he left the MOD in 1992, and he began to acknowledge the relationship between disarmament and nonproliferation. To quote from part three of the book, the collapse of the Soviet Union had a powerful impact on his thinking. The West no longer faced what Quinlan referred to as a brutal athe uh, atheistic totalitarian superpower, which meant that much of the context for his arguments about the logic and morality of nuclear deterrence had suddenly changed. The collapse of the Soviet Union had a powerful impact on his thinking. The West no longer faced what Quinlan referred to as a brutal atheistic totalitarian superpower. Um, the timing of Quinlan's retirement, just as the Cold War ended, facilitated this process. Suddenly, 
he was free from his official responsibilities, released from some of the tight constitutional re restrictions on his ability to engage in public debate and able to turn his mind to a more conceptual uh, uh, exploration of the, of the future. Reading through Quinlan's letters from this period, it seems as though the seeds of nuclear disarmament had suddenly found the right conditions to germinate. Changes in the international system provided the sunshine and intellectual freedom the rain. Mm -hmm. The result was not a sudden flowering of disarmament optimism or advocacy, but uh, a steady growth of interest in disarmament possibilities. His output showed that until his death in 2009, Quinlan remained uncertain about the plausibility and desirability of a disarmed world and the conditions under which nuclear abolition might be possible. But he had begun to probe some interesting questions and in doing so overturned some of his own disarmament resistance and contributed to nuclear debates that are still center stage today. Time permitting, Tanya was ready to uh, make some comments about a few of Michael uh, Quinlan's correspondence. As noted in the book's cl concluding remarks, one of Quinlan's friends remarked that what amazed him most about Quinlan was his naive determination to engage in reasoned argument with people whom he had absolutely no hope of convincing and who in turn had no hope of convincing him. He put this down to Quinlan's essential civility, which forced him to exchange an exchange of views that most people in his position would have regarded as a futile exercise and a waste of their time. Quinlan's correspondence has revealed a different view of his motivation, however, one driven not by civility, but by a belief in the power of, of persuasion and confidence in his own ability to, to shape the nuclear debate. Especially in the early to mid-1980s, he genuinely believed he could influence the thinking of even his most accomplished and determined critics. It was a question of highlighting the inconsistencies and weaknesses in their arguments and of encouraging them to face up to the full impl impl implications of their anti-nuclear stance. His early success in the late 1970s and early 1980s of using sophisticated reasoning to persuade the well-known pacifist Sidney Bailey that nuclear possession and use could in some circumstances be licit, spurred him to believe that given enough time and effort, other influential deterrence critics also could be swayed. That faith in his own skills and convictions inspired his patient and determined counteroffensive and kept it going until he began to question and reassess some of his own assumptions. Tanya thought the audience might be interested to know that she interviewed many of those of Sir Michael's correspondents who are still living today. They were charming and helpful and provided some fascinating insights. One especially lovely quote is the very first item in the notes section at the end of the book by journalist John Barry on the story of how he first met Michael Quinlan. Quote, my first recollection is going to meet him in his monastic office in the treasury, to which, if I recall, he'd been exiled only shortly before. I remarked on the dreary surroundings. He said he found them bracing. I walk down these corridors, and I say to myself, in these very corridors, people have been making a mess of economic policy for almost 200 years. <laughs> How could one not warm to him? <laughs> Thank you. Now we, um, uh, we have a slight problem as we don't have the author here. Um, we can't really get her to answer for her, um, for her comments. But if anyone would like to raise any questions or offer any comments, um, we would be delighted to have them as part of a sort of um, uh, a process of sharing. So if anyone has any views, any experience that they would like to share, it's too late for it to go in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. If you could introduce yourself. Uh, and to get up, to get the conversation going. First of all, I'd really like to thank you and congratulate you for 
organizing the evening so brilliantly and interestingly, despite the fact that Tanya is not here. I mean, it's been really fascinating. And secondly, both of you sort of recreating that amazing period at the uh, beginning of the 1980s and through the 1980s. Is this on all right? Or yes, not? fine, I think. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, I had the great privilege of, of uh, being part of groups that Mike was part of, Christian think, think tanks of one way or uh, another when I was Dean of King's. And um, he was hugely inf influential in, in my own life. I was, first of all, surprised by the remark that he felt uh, that the, uh, one of the, the evil of the Soviet Union resided in its atheistic communism. That never, ever came across any of the groups that I was involved in. Many of them were, were Christian groups. He never made that explicit. I'd always assumed the fact that it was a, 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 a tyranny like no other. Uh, and that was the ro root of it. And I do wonder if the letters are quoted from, le if they're from letters to the Catholic hierarchy, whether he really didn't emphasize that emphasis, uh, emphasize that aspect of it rather more than was, was, was part of it. I never got that, mm. uh, I never got that uh, impression. Um, uh, if I could um, just pick up Sir Richard uh, a, 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 a moment, I was particularly struck by the fact uh, that you said towards the beginning of what you said and your brilliant creation of that, of that period and of, of, of Michael, of course, you, you didn't really share uh, you know, his interest in ethics. I thought, this is very interesting. Top civil servants in this country, no interest in ethics. This is, isn't this rather odd? Isn't there something a bit strange here? Particularly when dealing with nuclear weapons. But secondly, the, then you went on to say, you re Michael really convinced you uh, about the moral need to engage uh, with nuclear weapons. You know, it brought in the moral dimension. Uh, and I just, I'm just passing that as, as, uh, on as a kind of the impression you left to me, whether you, you, without le leaving it open to you to how you respond to it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps I should offer a clarification. Um, <laughs> firstly, I, 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 first, I, uh, before I come to that, actually, he said, desperately thinking about what he was going to say. Uh, first, I, I think it's very interesting what you say about the, your point about atheistic and all that stuff. I, I didn't have any of that either. Um, so I, I wonder whether, um, without getting into the depths of all of this, whether some of this was in particular contexts, as, yeah. as you were saying, where um, he was seeking to establish some common ground on which he could then uh, build. One of the problems I have is, is it's only when I hear people feedback what I've said that I realize that I didn't express myself very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> what I think I was trying to say is, uh, actually it's two slightly, uh, slightly contradictory um, uh, things. I, I don't myself think that there is enough um, focus and discussion about, perhaps about ethics in um, in the way in which public servants uh, uh, do their work. But equally, of course, you are busy doing many, many things. Uh, now, uh, you are not, you know, you are required as a civil servant to be, uh, to operate within the law. And if you're a civil servant, you also operate to certain codes of behavior, which are very, very important and uh, in the best civil servants, very deep seated. But actually, you're not employed to sort of engage in. Uh, a philosophy seminar on an hourly or a daily basis. So um, I think the point I was trying to capture was perhaps, he said now really in deep, deep trouble, uh, uh, that we didn't conduct a philosophy seminar. Um, and we certainly focused on how we could uh, deal with certain aspects of, of, uh, of, of the arguments that were being developed, and we were acutely conscious of the importance of persuading people, including um, uh, people in various um, uh, churches, of the morality of what we were doing. But that was only one part of, of what we were up to. I certainly wasn't trying to advocate that civil servants should not have uh, a set of morals or think about things ethically. Um, I'll keep digging now. Uh, uh, of course, the other thing which I think is really fascinating uh, I, had no, I had no idea that all this correspondence was going on, although I might have, I might have guessed about it. And um, I absolutely admire the huge sort of uh, energy and, and, uh, and uh, commitment it shows. 
But also, I think that there's something perhaps we haven't mentioned yet, which is that Michael Kindler was a Jesuit, and he was an incredibly able, brilliant uh, Jesuit, and I think he believed in, as a trained Jesuit, this was very, very striking, I think, for those who had the privilege uh, uh, to attend his funeral or, or, or the service at Westminster Cathedral, he believed in the power of argument and his, in his capacity to persuade people by the power of argument. And of course, he was really quite brilliant at it. A uh, last point I'll make is, because um, uh, this was also touched on, uh, there, there's a bit of an implication, and this does come out in some of the letters, that he might have been sort of abrupt and rude with people. One of the things which I think is most admirable about, about him, and I think lots and lots of things are admirable about him, is although he was a very, very clever person, I never saw him put down a person who was less clever than him. He wouldn't do it. So he might engage in robust correspondence um, with people who he regarded as capable of robust correspondence. Uh, I could, <laughs> I don't have it unfortunately, but I could show you his comments on a draft I wrote once about the case for and against nuclear weapons, which came back with every sentence corrected. <laughs> uh, but I took that rather as a compliment, you know, when I'd recovered and come to terms with it. <laughs> it was a sort of compliment that he was willing to treat me as his equal. And I did point out to him, well, not as much his equal, but, you know, someone it was worth debating with, I did point out to him it was supposed to be the case for and against deterrence, so we had to have something in it about against. Uh, and we sorted it out. But I never saw him put down people who were simply not capable of arguing at his level. And I think that was a very admirable quality. Yeah. And, and, in, and by the way, I think a close reading of the transcript of tonight's remarks will, will, will show that you did not personally say that you didn't share this ethical uh, uh, attention. You just made an illusion that maybe not everybody did. Uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Michael Shipster. Um, it, it might be better if... if uh, um, this, sesh, this part of the evening was devoted to recollections of Michael Quinlan. I didn't know him, although I met him once or twice. I was in the Foreign Office. I just want to share with you briefly my own experience of living in Moscow, 1981 to 83, as the first secretary in the embassy. Um, I've since left the Foreign Office. Um, studying the Soviet economy. It's two things that you said, Richard. Um, first of all, this, this, his, his concept that nuclear war was logically absurd. And also, that one must remember the times that one was living in. The Soviet Union that I saw at first hand, I traveled very widely, often just, just two people together, and talking to a wide range of people was, was, was a number of things. First of all, it was an Alice in Wonderland world of, of ignorance and fantasy. None of the Politburo had been to university. They'd been to party schools. None of them, except perhaps Gorbachev, the higher sort of agricultural school in, mm. in the sort of, uh, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the wheat lands. Mm. Um, almost none of them had been abroad. Mm. So for them, ringed by NATO and uh, facing in Reagan, someone who was prepared to sort of call it as it was, you know, for the West, for, for the United States, empire of evil, they were, I think, badly shaken and quite scared. So at that point, from 80 to 85, and I think there's, there's been quite a lot written about this, it felt like a, a period where anything could happen. Something could tip it over the edge. I mean, the, the Polish crisis nearly did. And there were one or two exercises, Abel Archer and so on, which, which have been written about, which suggested that they were badly in, in danger of, of, of misunderstanding Western motives. And, and I think, uh, there probably wasn't an alternative once the stuff had been invented, you know, for there to be some sort of standoff. But, but nuclear deterrence is a, at best a very fragile state. I'm not an expert, Mark is. And, and when we contemplate India PAC or, you know, nuclear weapons in the Middle East, you know, I just think the idea of nuclear deterrence, I'm just wondering as an observation, it was so fragile then when there was sort of rough parity and maybe the ignorance sometimes worked, you know, in, in our favor along with a lot of luck, but whether you know, nuclear deterrence really is now you know, something that we can't easily talk about. That's a thought. I, I think we'll take that as a comment, maybe, unless... Uh, <laughs> oh, I just wanted to comment. Yeah. 
I, I, I just make uh, one comment, which is I think if I, um, which perhaps follows on a little bit, if I have a reservation, and this would be you know, a very dangerous thing for me to say, if I have a reservation about the way in which a lot of this correspondence is conducted, it is conducted between people who are in a Western tradition with a very strong focus on rational thought and logic. And I think this is the point I make, actually, and I wrote a brief introduction to the, to the correspondence. Um, I'm just always a little bit uneasy, which is a variation, I think, of your point, Michael, that you know, even in our society, things don't always get handled logically and rationally. And some of the societies we're dealing with, this is, I think, your point, they may think about things very differently to ours. And so there's a very important warning note, which is, yeah, we can have these debates amongst ourselves, but we must be very cautious about assuming that our frameworks fit all circumstances. Let me ask uh, Robert Fox and then Norman Domley in succession. I'm sorry, I, I'd just like to make an observation as well. Um, Michael Quinlan was a master of email very early on. And uh, the <coughs> phrase that leaps to mind is, is the deceptive felicity of his style. He was the most elegant exponent of that. And I'm very sorry to hear uh, so far uh, the, 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 the ghost at the feast that is missing is the wonderful Quinlanism. I'd like to make the following points in no particular order of importance. <laughs> <laughs> and then you would get this list of layered arguments absolutely brilliantly prepared. And I think that it's a good point now to mention his kindness to younger journalists, some of us are not so young now, uh, after he gave up the reins of power. He spent infinite time and patience on us. And I got very deeply into an email discussion with him about could you have nuclear deterrence in a non-bilateral deterrent mm. era. And he was deeply worried about India PAC. Mm. And the second thing was, of course, what should we do about replacing Trident? And we had a long and, for Michael at least, a rather rambling correspondence about this. And he said, you know, in the end, it is not sufficient to say we must stop the French being the unique Western European nuclear power. And we'd have these wonderful correspondence with great warmth, great elegance, great ordering of argument, but they would always end with, you must argue, Robert, for scrapping the aircraft carrier project at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, if I could just comment one thing before we get to Norman. Well, I think that was confidential, that <laughs> remark that he made. <laughs> We, we, um, one of the, one of the, um, the things that Tanya lamented was that she didn't have access to very many emails uh, because unlike uh, letters, he didn't, he didn't file them uh, in this alphabetical uh, files. We, we got some emails, but um, that, was, uh, that was one, uh, one un unfortunate uh, uh, advent of technology. And she makes a very good point about, well, therefore, what history is going to make of things in the email world. And it yeah. will. Uh, Norman. Norman Domley, University of Sussex. It's very interesting hearing what was happening in the Soviet Union. Speak a little bit closer. What was happening in the Soviet Union in the early 1980s and how things could e easily have tipped the wrong way. I was in Moscow during the Cuban Missile Crisis in autumn 1962. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was frightening. Frightening for us because we knew what was happening. I was a v visitor. I was a British exchange student at Moscow University. But the Russians or the Soviets knew nothing. They hadn't been told what was happening. And that was really what was so frightening afterwards that we came to the possibly, the, probably the closest to a hot war that we've had since 1945. And most of the people affected knew nothing whatever about it. <coughs> and one other point, um, it was interesting to hear that um, so Michael gave this talk in 1990 to the Soviet High Command. 
they would have been familiar with the arguments. Hmm. Andrei Sakharov had got into a lot of trouble, and I taught as the person who invited Sakharov to, to Britain in 1989, at least the, uh, Adam Roberts and I uh, um, invited him separately from Oxford and Sussex. And why Sakharov got into trouble originally in the Soviet Union, because he made that sort of argument to the Soviet political leadership and was told it wasn't the job of scientists to talk politics. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're getting close to 7.30. I think I might turn the tables and ask a question of my own to uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Nick Redman, who was the editor of the uh, Adelphi uh, series. And uh, uh, what was it like uh, editing uh, Tanya's uh, manuscript? <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much, Mark. And, and, and thank you also, uh, Sir Richard. Um, it was uh, an unusual Adelphi to do in some ways. The, um, the Adelphi books that we've had before uh, this one uh, were on Yemen, politics, permanent crisis. Uh, there was a book on North Korea and nuclear weapons within the North Korean regime and, and defense and security policy there. Um, before that, there was a James Acton book, which I'm sure Michael would have uh, enjoyed if he you know, had a chance to read it, on, uh, on nuclear deterrence as stockpiles are run down. Um, so this book was uh, a one-off for us. I don't think we'd probably do anything like it again. It's also unique, and it'll probably be the only triple-numbered Adelphi that we ever pull off. I'm looking there at Alex Nichol, the director of publications, who's sort of nodding and saying, yes, yes, don't try it. Um, I, I think it, it's a book that's actually quite difficult to, to categorize. As, as, as Mark said, um, there are you know, three big themes in it. Um, the first is the sort of logic and morality of nuclear deterrence. And, and as a reader, I, I found it fascinating, reader and as an editor, I found it fascinating to see someone struggling so much with trying to square the circle and applying a rapier-like intelligence to that. Um, then on the, the strategic decisions, particularly the, uh, abolition, uh, the acquisition of Trident, I was very struck um, as, as a voter and as a taxpayer just by how much some of the civil service actually try to consult quite broadly uh, when making these decisions. Um, and then the third, the third uh, theme is uh, arms control and disarmament. And there it was very interesting to see somebody uh, who had constructed so many arguments in favor of disarmament, actually revisiting some, uh, in favor of deterrence, revisiting some of those and actually questioning himself. I mean, that's a hallmark of, of the finest intellects that they are willing to challenge themselves and go back over old territory and, and revisit some of those arguments and some of those opinions. Um, so a fascinating book. Uh, those of you who aren't ISS members, I <laughs> strongly encourage you to buy it. Um, um, I, I just a final few words about, about Tanya. Um, in a way, I, I struggle to, to categorize this book properly. The closest thing I can get and one that I find and as an unsatisfactory label is uh, an intellectual biography. But in a way, it's more than that. And some of the letters go beyond that, and they are quite personal. And the man that comes through um, is one who, uh, in his personal relationships, goes above and beyond the call of duty in forwarding some of those arguments and driving some of those arguments through to their logical conclusions. Um, Tanya, I think, has done a wonderful job in striking such a good balance between um, the letters and the content and then her own exposition and her, um, her ability to build a narrative in order to explain these and put these in the correct context. Um, I, I hope you'll I agree that, that when you read the book that that's what she's done. I, I think she's done a fantastic job. It was a very difficult project, and I think she pulled it off with Ilan. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, I have an administrative announcement, but let me give the floor to Sir Richard for a final comment. I just wanted to make two very quick comments following on from that. The first is that um, when I was, uh, Tanya showed me the manuscript, and we actually had a discussion about uh, some bits of it. And um, I must confess that it came into my mind that Michael Quinlan would really have enjoyed arguing with her about some of her comments <laughs> uh, upon his arguments as expressed in his correspondence. Uh, and so I felt in a way, you know, there was a rather sort of sadness in my mind as I tried to pick out one or two of the things which I knew I didn't feel were quite right. Actually, some of them have been changed. I don't, I don't want to get into that. 
but there was someone missing, really, from the argument. Secondly, I know you're all now totally gutted to learn that ISS are not going to be publishing the correspondence of Sir Richard Mottram. <laughs> <laughs> Very sorry. Um, so on that note, um, for IISS members, uh, your copies of the Adelphi book were posted today, and you'll get them very soon. Family members should see Tony about getting their book. For others, and for those in the first two categories who, like me, would like to have one copy at their home, one copy in their office, uh, books are for sale downstairs at the reception at a reduced price today. The, uh, uh, the uh, paperbacks are only uh, 12 pounds. The special deluxe uh, Hardback, uh, hardbound copies are for 30 pounds downstairs at the reception. Thank you all for your, your presence. It has been a very enjoyable evening. And uh, thank you, Sir Richard.